All right, as we finish up September, we are going to work on our proving ground number one. And I introduced it in last class, but we didn't even have enough time to make a video introducing it. So we're going to do a pretty deep introduction to it right now. If we go to our homepage, start there. You're going to find whenever we introduce a new assignment, a new lesson, it has its own unit module. So we just finished turning in our creature concepts. Now we're going to start proving ground number one. Proving grounds are different. We talk about this because there are four of them through the semester to teach you a specific skill in creative problem solving. And if you get 100% on all proving grounds, by the end of the semester, you will earn a creative problem solving badge. You can find information about that once it's linked under the badges sidebar. And they still haven't activated it, though I've contacted them. They will when it, when it matters at the end of the semester. So what's interesting about the way the badges worked, that's to prove a, a 21st century skill, is that you need to learn these skills in a very specific way and demonstrate that you've learned them. So there are four skills for creative problem solving. The first is to be able to identify patterns. That might seem really simple. Oh, that's a checkerboard. Oh, that's a halftone dot pattern. Oh, that's paisley. But that's not what they mean. They mean to understand what's in front of you, understand how those aspects work, and make sense of the things you see that, don't, that you don't fully understand. So they're going to break up that skill of identifying patterns into these three skills. The first is making sense of the data. So the data for digital media and digital imaging for raster images, which we are comp uh, compositing with, is the resolution and the physical dimension. Understanding that data helps us understand how this image can be used, right? For digital presentation or for physical presentation through printing. The second skill we're going to learn is recognizing commonalities among seemingly unrelated situations. So what does that mean? When you have a bunch of different data and you've already created a creature and you've created a landscape, by putting that creature into the landscape, you need to identify what is related between them and what is disparate, unrelated. And then you're gonna learn how to make those things match. So the two things you're gonna make match are the light direction, because your landscape has its own use of light, and then your creature has its own use of light. That's not just the direction of light, it's also the color of the light, it's also the quality of the light. We're gonna make them match. And to do that, we need to recognize commonalities and then fix the things that, are, that seem unrelated. And we also need to match the angle of the anatomy. We need our creature to be able to stand up or fly over or swim in the environment we place it. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to use chalk. Right? We're going to use this a lot more when we talk about animation. So this stool represents our stage. So it's like it was a theater for us. And what we talked about when we designed the setting, we were creating a backdrop. Right? That's why you don't want any figures of plain paper. No, no backdrop. Nothing that would be considered convenient. So we put that backdrop down. Now we're introducing a figurative element, which is our creature. Now we designed our creature in a certain code that was very clear for its anatomy. So if it was this guy, this is a Sigma-6 roadblock figure. Very rare. More than $5. So let's say that's the code that we designed our creature. If I just put them right into it like that, that doesn't necessarily match the backdrop, the terrain. So let's go to our figurative concept, which because we understood their skeletal structure, we are able to pose them in a way to fit with the background. Not only that, because we created our backgrounds with foreground, middle ground, and background, we're not just putting our creature in front
we are putting our creature amongst the seven lovely hills. So we, in our landscape, there's a foreground. Those are like the props at the edge of the stage that our actors, our creatures, will walk behind. And mostly our creatures are going to occupy the middle ground. But it will depend on how you design it. So we'll have all those options. Basically, we decide how big or small your creature is, but we want this proving ground to really show off our creature, not hide our creature. So our creature needs to take up at least 25% of your finished creature space. And what we need to match is their angle of anatomy. So that needs to fit into the scene. Then the third skill that goes along with creative problem solving for identifying patterns is to frame novel problems in familiar terms. So by using your fantasy creature and putting it into a landscape, that is a novel problem. No one's had to do that before. Whether it's your own landscape or whether it's a landscape you found online. Because remember, if you don't like your fantasy landscape, you can fit your fantasy creature into a found landscape. It's still a novel problem. But you might need to create foreground elements and that kind of thing. How do you frame them Framing is coming to understand, put them into you know, a, uh, a concept that makes sense to you. How do you frame them in familiar terms? Well, we're going to do this through a narrative. So if I was your game master and we were playing a role-playing role game, D&D, &D, you all have your creatures. You get a character sheet for your creature, right? You know what your creature looks like, but now you get to write your backstory for your creature. And not only are you writing the backstory for your creature, you're writing about how it lives in the environment that you're putting it into. So we're trying to put it into familiar terms for us, even if these are really fantasy situations. So all three of those things are needed for the proving ground. Let's look at some past examples. So this is the creature scape. This is what we'll mostly focus on today, putting our fantasy creature into our fantasy environment and then making the angle of the anatomy match so it looks like the feet are actually touching down, like the weight is dispersed correctly, and making the lighting match, right? So that's number one of the rubric. Second part of the rubric is understanding the data, recognizing the patterns in the data. The data that matters is that once we have finished our creature scape where the creature is at least 25% of the image, this creature is about 25%, then we check our image size and we set it at resample image with resample image unchecked. We set the pixels to be 300 pixels per inch and we see what our physical dimensions are in inches. And if our physical dimensions at 300 pixels per inch are eight by 10 inches or larger, then we have the appropriate data for standard print resolution and we label it like that. But if we set it at 300 pixels per inch and our physical dimensions are smaller than eight by 10 inches, then we change the pixels per inch to 72 pixels per inch and see how many inches it gives us. And that is what it's going to be at standard screen resolution. If your image is smaller than eight by 10, at 72 pixels per inch, you have to redo it because that's not useful for anything. But no one will do that small. That's, so that's the second part of the rubric is not only identifying correctly your physical inches and your resolution at either 300 or 72, but identifying whether that's good for screen or whether that's good for print. Because right? that tells you what you can do with that image. And then the third requirement, this is the D&D the &D character sheet, right? You're going to tell us about your character and how it lives in this environment. It helps you interrogate all of those different decisions. Like, what does it breathe? What does it eat? What are its predators? And that's going to help you understand the connections that you want, that you want to make. So that if you choose in the next assignment, assignment three, to animate your creature in this environment, you have an idea of how you would animate it, right? So because I 
say here, it feasts on de de the decaying wood of ancient forests. That's a new thing I made up, but it frames it in familiar terms. This creature eats, so this is what it eats, right? So then when I animate, I could show it eating, and that might be interesting. Then I mean, what does it do with that? I don't know. It camouflages easily, so maybe it eats, and then like a, uh, like a beaver, it creates a little a, a hideout for itself. I don't know. It'll get you to think about these things. So here are some student examples doing the same things. This one's set at screen resolution because sometimes you end up cropping down or just having resolution mishaps in the first project, but it's still usable as long as you can identify it at screen resolution. Yes, and identify its resolution and its purpose, whether it's good enough resolution for screen or for print. And all of this is outlined in the rubric. So each proving ground will have really specific rubrics. All right, so how do we get started? So we see this happen all the time. We see fantasy creatures and fantasy landscapes all the time. We see it on TV, we see it in movies. We can find it on Pixabay, this is one example. And one way they almost always do it is they make the environment really dark and really blurry, right? You know a dinosaur is gonna show up in the movie when it starts raining and everything gets really cloudy. So that's one way to obscure the texture. And this image does that with coloring, right? And with this kind of soft focus mist. Another way to do it is to do what we're gonna try to do and try to match the angle of the anatomy and the lighting. And if you do that, then you can add the atmosphere and the obfuscation of the, the mist and everything will look super believable. But let's look at this example. This is from the 1996 movie Space Jam. And you have Michael Jordan here shot on film with certain lighting. And Michael Jordan is a three-dimensional person in a three-dimensional space. So then you take these Looney Tune characters that are not three-dimensional, right? But you light them as though they are. So you have light coming from the top. You're recognizing that from the Michael Jordan reference. You have cast shadows underneath them. And you're going to angle their anatomy, not like they're in a two-dimensional Looney Tunes cartoon, but so that their feet are squarely placed in the perspective of this three-dimensional basketball court. And even though the characters don't match at all, you would never mistake Michael Jordan for a Looney Tune. By matching the light direction and the angle of anatomy, they believably occupy the same space. Just like Mary Poppins and animated penguins did many decades before this example. And who framed Roger Ebert, which is a masterpiece in this. So here are the different rubrics. Only one of them has to do with the actual picture. Right? The other two are the data that goes along with the picture. But this one, this middle one, where we are trying to match both the light direction and the angle of anatomy to our setting are what we're gonna start with today. And to show that, I'm gonna teach you a new skill, which is called a non-destructive overlay layer. And for this semester, I go back and forth, but for this semester, I'm making this a requirement for this project so that everyone learns how to do this. It's what you see being used on this past student example, but we're gonna make it obvious by just turning it from overlay mode to normal mode once we've done it. This is a way you can dodge and burn on both the setting and on the creature without ever hurting your original picture. Okay, so let's get into it. I'm gonna find my project. I'm gonna start by opening up my assignment one folder and finding my finished PSD, which I usually mark as green. Then I open up photo P as we are used to doing, get it into this tab. And I'm going to drop that PSD right into the Photo P browser. You want your landscape to have multiple layers. 